Today I want to share with you a message from Nehemiah. I forget, I have a terrible memory. Somebody shared with Nehemiah recently. Uh, today I want to share with you again from Nehemiah chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 16 through 18. And the title of today's message is called Wall Builders. Wall Builders. I don't know whether we have anyone here in construction, but I will not be talking about construction, believe it or not. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 18, I mean 16 through 18. Let's all read it together in one voice. Let's begin. The city officials did not know I had been out there or what I was doing, for I had not yet said anything to anyone about my plans. I had not yet spoken to the Jewish leaders, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or anyone else in the administration. But now I say to them, you know very well what trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. Then I told them about how the gracious hand of God has been on me and about my conversation with the king. They replied at once, Yes, let's rebuild the wall. So they began the good works. Throughout the Bible, it's, I think it's a common census, the two of the greatest kings, the rulers that Israel had, was King David and King Solomon. They worshipped God, they served God, and they were very, very devoted to God. But sadly, after King David and King Solomon, the kings that followed after them, they weren't as good. They began to compromise. They began to compromise worship of their God. They began to invite other gods into their culture. They began to allow different idols to inhabit their country. And when God saw that, he said, you know what? I have to pass judgment upon them. I cannot allow this to happen. In other words, God said, I have to punish them for their sins. So God punished them by allowing foreign nations, foreign countries, to invade and conquer and enslave the Jewish, the Israelites, the nation of Judah. In 1722, God allowed the Assyrians to conquer and rule over the Jews, the Israelites uh, and the Jewish people. In, eight, in 600 BC, God allowed the Babylonians to conquer them and rule over them. But when the Babylonians conquered them, they did something, uh, they did something unlike the other nations. What they did was they gathered all the skilled people of Israel, you know, the, 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 the teachers, the carpenters, the the, what do you call it, the, uh, the blacksmiths, all the people with skills. And they made them, they enslaved them, and they moved them to the current place of Babylon. They wanted them to use those skills for their nations. So they were exiled to the, their country in Babylon, which is a, currently located in near Iraq. Then in 539 B.C., the Persians invaded and conquered uh, the Babylonians, along with, of course, the Israelites, the Jews. But when the Persians invaded and took over and ruled over them, Persians showed favor upon the Jews. And the way they showed favor was they allowed all the Jewish people that were living in Babylon, who were exiled there, they allowed them, if they want to, they had a choice to go back to their homeland, to go back to their city of Jerusalem. Among them, there was a man named Nehemiah. But strangely, Nehemiah decided to stay in Babylon and not go back to Jerusalem. And the reason for that was because Nehemiah, over the years, he has risen uh, to a high place, in great stature in, and in great position. He was the cupbearer for the king of Persia. Cupbearer is like the position of being a vice president, the most trusted person by the king. And because of his high position, Nehemiah decided to stay. But one day, as time passed, Nehemiah changed his mind. Because as time passed, as more people went back to Jerusalem, and the news of Jerusalem began to come back to him, he, he decided, I must go back to Jerusalem. And the news that he heard from people was that the Jerusalem was now lying in ruins. Once, the shining beacon of all Israel was now burned destroyed, the walls torn down, the gates, gates burned. It was in utter ruins. And when Nehemiah heard about this, 
about Jerusalem, he began to weep and he made a commitment. I'm going to go back. And I'm going to go back and I'm going to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And when he went back, he surveyed the city. He saw the temples in ruin. He saw the uh, houses utterly and totally destroyed. He saw the wall, walls torn down. He saw the gates being burned. But as he surveyed the city, he made a decision. This is what I must do. I must rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. The question that I want to ask you is this. Why, of all the things, all, of all the things that he could have rebuilt, why the wall? Why must he rebuild the wall first? Why not the temple? Why not the homes? Why the wall? In order, for us to, in order for us to better understand this, we need to understand the meaning of Jerusalem, what the city meant. You know, for us, when we mention the city like Tejan or Seoul, you know, you say, well, Seoul is a capital. You know, Tejan, maybe it's a science town. We need to understand that Jerusalem was more than just a town, more than a capital. Jerusalem symbolized a place of worship. Annually, people, the Jews from all over the, all, all over the land, they would gather in the city of Jerusalem for the single purpose of worship. You see, the city of Jerusalem was more than just a city. It was a symbol of worship. It was a symbol of God's presence. It was a symbol of all the believers gathering together in harmony, in one voice, united, worshiping and celebrating God. It was a place of worship. Nehemiah, being man of God, when he saw this city, a place of worship in utter ruins, he said, I've got to rebuild it. But before I rebuild the temple, before I rebuild the homes, before I rebuild the roads or anything else, I must first build the wall. Why? Because as long as the walls are, not, are torn down, this cannot be a place of worship. Because unless the walls are standing tall and strong, safe from invaders, safe from thieves, safe from robbers, this place cannot be a place of worship. So before, he wanted, before they could build any other things in the city, he said, we must first rebuild the wall. Today I want to ask you a question. And I want you to think really hard about this. What kind of church do you want? When you came to church today, what were your expectations about this church? In other words, why do you come to church? I hope that all of you will agree with me when I say that Anf is a great church filled with great people. And it's a place that I hope and pray that each and every week Everyone that comes will leave having experienced God. But in order for Anne to continue to grow and continue to be a church that you want it to be, our walls has to stand strong. Just like the walls of Jerusalem must stand strong for the city of Jerusalem to be a true place of worship, our walls must stand strong for Anne to be a true place of worship. I say this from the bottom of my heart. And for those of you that know me, you know I mean what I say. When I say that I am truly honored to be your pastor. It's hard for me to say, but I've been a pastor now for 17 years. And when I look at you, when I see you, it is my honor and privilege to be your pastor. I believe that this is a wonderful church. And it is my honor to be considered your spiritual leader. But I believe we can do more. I believe we should do more. And we can do more. But in order for us to do more, we need to build up our walls. And I'm not talking about taking some bricks and building a wall around this campus. What I'm talking about is building the wall, spiritual walls around us. 
Bible tells us, and the most scholars agree, that there are four spiritual walls in our lives. There are four spiritual walls that every church must build in order for it to be a true place of worship. And today I want to share with you those four walls. And I want you guys to really, as you hear this message, think about what are the areas in which I can help? What are the, you know, which walls, which section can I be helpful to? The first wall that I want to share with you that we must build is the wall of God's Word. Why? Because the Word of God is is essential for church to remain pure and righteous. A Word of God is essential in in order for the church to remain pure and righteous. You go to a church where they teach philosophies. If you go to a church where they teach you know, nice things, good deeds. I'm going to tell you a church, they're going to lose focus and focus mainly on having fun. But a church that remains in God's word, a church that focuses on God's word will stay true, pure, and focused and righteous. I want Anf to be a, such a church. Psalm 119 verse 9, it says, How can a young person stay pure? By obeying your word. Psalm 119, verse 11, he says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. See, we must build a wall of God's word around all nations' community fellowship. I want this church to be a pure church, a righteous church, and not a place where people come just to hang around and have fun, but a church that obeys God and does the will of God. Word of God is also essential for the church to stay in God's good and perfect will. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to to guide my feet and a light for my path. Psalm 119, verse 133 says, guide my steps by your word so I will not be overcome by evil. You know, one of the things that we struggle as Christians is to make sure that, you know, God, are we in your will? Are we really doing what you want us to do? Because in the end, that is the most important thing in our lives, that we do, we live our lives according to God's will. And as a church, we must stay focused on God's word. We must study God's word. We must teach and share and preach God's word. And we must study God's word. That's why as your pastor, I really, I really try to devote as much time as I can whenever I try to prepare a Sunday message. But there has to be more. Not just about me coming here and telling you and sharing with you God's word. It has to be more. Having God's word, building the wall of God's word, it's not a once a week event. It is a daily event. It is something that we need to do, we should do, we ought to do every day of our lives. That's why quiet time is almost essential for our daily lives. For those of you who do not know what quiet time is, quiet time is taking time each and every day. few moments, 10 minutes, 15, 20 30 minutes or an hour, depending on the person or the situation. Spending each and every day reading God's word and meditating. Because each and every day, as we read the word of God, it purifies our hearts. As we read God's word each and every day, God helps us to stay focused on his path. Therefore, we must be diligent in studying God's word. And I just want to challenge you. Beginning this Thursday, I've been saying this for the past four or five weeks. We're beginning and we're starting Alpha Course. Alpha Course is an 11-week basic Christianity course that I'm giving. And, uh, and I just want to encourage you guys. I know that all of you, you have a busy schedule. But if we say that we're too busy to study God's words, then already we already failed. Now, you might not have time this week, uh, this semester, but I'll be offering this class uh, twice a year. This time around, it'll be on Thursdays. Next time, it'll be on Sundays to accommodate those of you with a different schedule. But we need to take take advantage of these opportunities to build this wall of God's word. Second spiritual wall that needs to be built is the wall of fellowship. Can you repeat after me? Fellowship. And I'm not talking about the the 30-minute meal time that we have after church. Now, that too is fellowship, part of fellowship, but that's not what I'm talking about. What I am talking about is a true community of people 
that love and care for one another. True definition of fellowship is not eating together after the church. That's a small part of it. True definition of fellowship is a community of believers, of people that genuinely love and care about each other. And this is a wall that we must build in order for this place, for Anf, to be a true place of worship. Why? Because true worship can only happen when like-minded people come together, unified, not only in goal, but also unified in love. Galatians chapter 2 says, Share each other's burdens, and in this way obey the law of Christ. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 1 says, Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. In Psalm 133 verse 1 says, How wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. Do you see the common theme, common denominator among all these passages? God is emphasizing, God is stressing to us the importance of fellowship, of community of people, of believers, gathering together, praying for each other, loving one another, genuinely, honestly caring for one another. Some of you may be doubting this, that when you write your prayer request, surely Pastor Paul doesn't pray over my prayer request. I do, and I make sure that I do. Because I believe, and I wanted this uh, AM congregation to be a community. And I, that's why I remind you each and every week to write your prayer request, because this is a community, and I truly want all of us to have fellowship. That is why also family group is vital. You have heard me repeat this over and over again about family groups. And I know that, you know, I know that many of you guys have been waiting for this, and it's going to happen, and it's going to happen actually this week. But my wife and I and many of the singles here, we have been meeting for the past, I think, four weeks, uh, having our family group, family meeting. And the reason why this is so important is because you cannot have true fellowship unless you gather together. Because how can you share each other's burden? How can you pray for one another? How can you love someone if you don't spend time together, intimate time together? You know, we're not a large group yet. But we're, lar we're, we're large enough where we cannot have true fellowship in this context. We must get smaller in order for us to have true fellowship. So I want to encourage you, and I, and, I, and I think many of you guys also share with me that you're looking forward to it. But I want to encourage you to be faithful to the family group because we cannot have true worship unless we have true fellowship with one another. In order for us to have true worship, we must build the walls of God's word and the walls of fellowship. And thirdly, we must build a wall of the Great Commission. The Great Commission. Repeat after me. The Great Commission. Now some of you are saying, some of you are not familiar with this term. The Great Commission means the Great Command. We must build a wall of the Great Command. Great Command by our God, Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 5, verse 42, it says, And every day in the temple and from the house to house, they continue to teach and preach this message. Jesus is the Messiah. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. Therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You cannot have true worship unless the place is filled with people who shares the good news of Jesus with others. You cannot have true worship. You cannot have true church unless you have a place where good news of Jesus is shared with one another. Let me, ask, let me share this story with you. Let's pretend for a minute, and let me pretend that this really happened to me. One day I'm driving. I'm driving in the middle of a storm. I mean, it's just raining cats and dogs. You can barely see the front of you. And I'm driving in a countryside road. And as I was driving, 
I see a sign that says bridge ahead. So I'm driving and I'm driving. But just on the last minute, last second, I noticed that the bridge has been washed away. It's gone. Because of the storm, the bridge could not stand the current and it got washed away. And I stopped just enough, barely in time, just barely enough in time to save my life and save my car. Now I know this fact that saved my life that could, that could also save other people's life. And in my mind, I know that, you know what? Unless somebody warns other people of this danger, tonight some people might die. So if I and if we are good people, what should we do? The answer is obvious. Even if it's in the middle of a storm, even if you're busy, even if you're tired, it doesn't matter. We have the obligation as a good human being, as a good person, to stand in the middle of the road and warn and stop the traffic, warn people from going ahead straight to the path of destruction. We have that obligation. In a way, that is Christianity. The Bible has taught us this truth. That unless that we give our lives to Jesus Christ, that we are going to perish. We know this truth. And knowing this truth, how can we not share this with other people? To do otherwise would be evil. And all of us here, I don't think we're evil. In fact, I think we're just the opposite. I, can, I look at all of you, and you have such a great heart and wonderful heart. And as a church, and as a place of true worship, if we are not warning people of the danger, and if we are not doing our best to save people from imminent danger, then we cannot have true worship. So if we want all nations community fellowship to be a place where we can come and have true worship, we must build a wall of great commission, of the great commission. And lastly, the final spiritual wall that we must build is the wall of prayer. In Acts chapter 1, verse 14, it says, They all met together and were constantly unified, united in prayer, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. Devote yourself, Colossians chapter 4, 2 and 3, devote yourself to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us too that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mystery, mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I am here in chain. We pray because prayer convicts our hearts. We pray because prayer moves God. We pray because prayer gives us strength. We pray because through prayer, we are closer to God. How can we say we want to worship God, to be intimate with God, unless we have that wall of prayer? So if we want this church, this place, to be a place of true worship, we must build up this wall. Just as when Nehemiah surveyed this, the city of Jerusalem, and he knew that unless the walls were built up, and unless the walls were tall and strong, that Jerusalem could never be a place of worship. So for all nations community fellowship, we too must build a wall, build up a tall and strong wall. So I, so I ask you again, why do you come to church? What kind of a church do you want? And lastly, what are you doing to make angst? What are we doing? to make angst 
as such a church. I am here because I believe all nations community fellowship that it is a special place of worship where God is present. And I know that you believe that too. And I believe that this ministry has great potential to do really, really great things for God. Therefore, we must continue to devote ourselves to build around this church the spiritual walls of God's word, God's fellowship, the great commission, and the wall of prayer. I want to close by reading Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 18, once more. Then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me, and about my conversation with the king. They replied at once, Yes, let's rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. Let's rebuild the wall. And may these words be our answer. Yes, let's rebuild the wall. Let us pray.